Good day, everyone, and welcome to another screencast here in microbiology. I am your professor for today, Dr. Sipache Bashi, and for this session, we will talk about the antimicrobial drugs. So, before anything else, of course, um, let me introduce to you some of the following terms that we will be useful in our discussion. So, let us discuss first what do we mean by antibiotics. So, when we say antibiotics, antibiotics refers to, uh, I mean, that's extract first word, antibiotics. So, antibiotics actually means against life. So, it is a substance produced by one organism that will inhibit the growth of another organism. Okay, and it, of course, the exact opposite of the word antibiotics would be probiotics. Okay, so drug pass means that your organisms had actually developed antimicrobial resistance or had actually developed drug resistance. Okay, now when we say combination therapy, combination therapy is the utilization of two or more antibiotics so that it will have an enhanced effect towards certain pathogens. So for example, um, let me point out to you um, the therapy that we're using for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we're using um, multiple drug therapy. We are using rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrocinamide, and etapitol for the treatment of tuberculosis. So that is an example of combination therapy. Now another example, um, have you ever heard of the word of the of the commercial antibiotic augmentin? Um, it's its generic name is actually coamoxiclav because it's a combination of amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. Amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. Okay, so if the enhanced or I mean if this combined drug had or has an enhanced killing rate, that's what you call synergism. But if the killing rate of this combined drug decreases, then that's what you call antagonism. So, a certain antibiotics can kill both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, so we call it antagonism. But when we say narrow spectrum, this particular antibiotic would have limited killing rates. Okay? So, let us discuss um, um, the history of chemo chemotherapy. So, do you know that um, even before, even in the late 1400s, chemotherapy of microbial infection is not new. So these South American Indians will actually extract uh, the part, uh, the, will actually extract quinine from the part of chinchona tree. So eventually this quinine, um, they are actually using it for the treatment of malaria. malaria. Okay, so actually that's the origin of the quinine that which until now people are actually using it and if you have actually read the news um, several months ago people were actually going crazy with quinidine as they thought that it could be a remedy for covid 19. now they have also been using mercury which is rather a, a harmful substance uh, to cure syphilis in the late 1400s in fact Many native herbal remedies are now being re-examined for potential sources of new antimicrobial agents. So the dawn of modern antimicrobial therapy began with the physician chemist Paul Ehrlich. So um, Paul Ehrlich became very uh, popular with the silver sun, um, which he called 606 um, because he failed 605 times and his 606 formula have become actually successful uh, and there's there are several reasons why the 605 formula formulate that the decocted did not actually become successful because of the term selective toxicity so when you say selective toxicity the the whatever it is that you are formulating has to be effective only against the microorganisms but not against the whole cell. So you cannot say that, oh, this antibiotic is really effective. It will kill the pathogens and at the same time it will kill you. So that's not much of all selective toxicity. Okay. However, one of the next major breakthroughs did not occur until 1930s. Okay. So Domag okay, discovered a red line known as the prontocyanin. 
So it was effective against infection in animals despite a lack of activity in the test tube. What does it mean? It means that the the protocil um, red compound is only um, successful or effective when it is in vivo. So the product made in vivo was sulfonamide and it was not locked or this drug was manufactured on a wide scale. So, so this protocil is otherwise known as the sulfa drugs. Okay, so sulfa drugs were actually introduced in, into field hospitals during the Second World War and saved countless lives from surgical infections. And this is now one of the greatest discovery of the 20th century, the discovery by the discovery of Sir Alexander Fleming, and it actually came by accident. So in 1928, Sir Alexander Fleming was working with Staphylococcus cultures in his laboratory in London. So perhaps he did not discard his plates right away, and his plate became contaminated with a certain mold known as penicillium. So, so he actually discovered that this penicillium, this mold, uh, developed zone of inhibition, meaning uh, the surrounding colonies of this particular mold. Okay, the bacterial colonies were inhibited. So. Fleming extracted the compound from the mold and he called it penicillin. So high mortality from infections during the Second World War provided the incentive for both British and then American scientists to develop methods for large-scale fermentation and extraction of penicillin from the foods. So this particular miracle drug was introduced on a large scale during the 1940s. But unfortunately, because of the indiscriminate use of antibiotics, these drugs, okay, this particular antibiotic, okay, many microorganisms had developed resistance against penicillin. Okay, so after the discovery of Alexander Fleming, the rush for new antibiotics was on. So thousands of cultures from sources across the world were screened for antibacterial activity. So in fact, there was this one antibiotic that was discovered in the Philippines, that is the erythromycin. It was actually discovered in Iloilo. So that's the reason why um, the first commercial name of erythromycin was Iloilo. Okay? And, and how ironic that the one who discovered um, erith uh, this particular antibiotic um, actually sold it to an American patent. And the irony of is that whenever we are buying this drug, we're buying it in a much expensive amount. That's the irony of it, okay? So anyway, streptomycin came from the soil, actinomycin streptomyces. So, lincomycin came from an isolate from the soil in Linton, Nebraska, and basidrosine came from an isolate of basidus species, isolated from the wound of a girl named Tracy. See? So, so, Organisms will produce substance that will inhibit the growth of another microorganisms. So, as you can see, these are some of the sources of antibiotics. So, bacitrosine came from Bacillus subtilis, polymyxin came from Bacillus polymyxa, amphotericin B came from Streptomyces nodosus, chloramphenicol came from Streptomyces venezuelae. Tetracycline came from Streptomyces orifacens, Neomycin came from Streptomyces pradiae, Streptomycin came from Streptomyces griseus, Gentamycin came from Streptomyces micromonospora, Cephalotine came from the Cephalosporin group of um, microorganisms, an example of fungus, Grisopulvin came from Prenicillium Grisopulvum, and the first antibiotic, Penicillin, was discovered by Alexander Fleming and it came from Penicillium notato. Hey, so what are the characteristics should the ideal drug must have? So first, I've discussed already about selective toxicity. So when you say, I'm sorry, so when you say selective toxicity, um, the, the drug, the active compound of the drug should be effective for the pathogen but not for the whole cells. 
it has to be microcytal rather than bacteriostatic. Although some antibiotics are bacteriostatic. So when you say microcytal, it can indeed kill microorganisms. It is stable even in the presence of organic compounds, even if they are found inside our body or in vivo, such as the bronchocele. And it is complementary to host defense, which means that antibiotics should never fight with your cells of the immune system. It must have extensive tissue distribution after you have taken them, and it should, and it has to be active even in the in, even in the presence of organic compound. Meaning, these antibiotics, these drugs have to be stable. So, there are actually different. Um, uh, ideal antimicrobial target site. So, so that's the reason why we will be classifying, okay, our 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 antibiotics with the five actions, five mechanisms of actions. However, for antiviral, um, it is actually different because, um, you know, so you might be wondering, how come during COVID nineteen we're not drinking antibiotics? Antibiotics or antibacterial drugs would only work against bacteria, but not against viruses. So you have to remember that. And then, of course, um, we also have different actions for antiparasitic uh, drugs. So since we're talking about bacteriology in this particular course, we will be concentrating ourselves with antibiotics, not with antiviral because that's supposed to be discussed in virology, not with antiparasitic drugs because uh, these drugs are supposed to be discussed in parasitology. Okay, our antifungal agents are supposed to be discussed in mycology. So forgive me if I'm going to skip this particular drug and jump right into the antibiotics or the antibacterial drugs. So as what I've mentioned, there are actually uh, five mechanisms of actions of antibacterial drugs. So some of them can inhibit cell wall synthesis, some of them can inhibit protein synthesis, some of, some of them may cause injury or destroy plasma membrane, some of them may inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, some of them may inhibit the synthesis of essential metabolites. So I have included in this module the animations related to this one, okay? So let's discuss first um, some of the antimicrobial drugs that can inhibit cell wall synthesis. Okay, hey, so as you can see here, um, penicillin can inhibit cell wall synthesis. So it's an example of antibiotics can, that, that can inhibit cell wall synthesis. And of course, when we say cell wall, we are actually referring to peptidoglycan. So penicillin inhibits the synthesis of peptidoglycan, thereby making the cell wall thick. So natural penicillin includes your penicillin G and penicillin G. So the ones that the, the one that was discovered by Alexander Fleming. So that's an example of a natural penicillin. However, nowadays we have already the so-called semi-synthetic penicillin, such as the oxacillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, astreonam, and infinem, the cephalosporins, uh, we have the cephalotin and cefexine. The polypeptide antibiotics would include bacitracine and vancomycin. The anti-TB drugs, um, which I've already mentioned before. So this includes um, isoniazid and etamidol. So uh, penicillin, um, so these are different examples. And cephalosporins, um, these are uh, drugs that have developed over time. So the third gen is already cefriaxone, ceftazidime. And if you will be looking in the journal, there are already fourth generation and fifth generation cephalosporins. Okay? Glycopeptides such as vancomycin is very important because um, if the antibiotic becomes, uh, if the drugs becomes, I'm sorry, if the organisms becomes MRSE, um, vancomycin would be the ultimate drug to touch. Okay? So penicillins are actually derivative of a basic structure known as the amino penicillinic acid. So note that this is the basic structure of, of beta-lactam antibiotics. So the basic structure is actually made up of this red structure here. Uh, we call it the beta-lactam ring. 
so majority of so if the organisms are able to produce the enzyme beta lactamase it will inactivate uh, this will destroy the beta lactam ring causing the inactivation of penicillin okay so first penicillins differ from each other in the side chains or what you call the r group which is actually attached to the amino group so as you can see here um, the r group the beta lactam rings are actually the same but the one that matters the one that differs among them among these antibiotics would be the r group for penicillin g methicillin which is the old name of oxacillin and then the amphicillin and then you have here the carbenicillin so the cephalosporins are closely related to penicillins they also have the beta lactam rings as part of the basic structure however we call it the cephalosporanic acid okay so the various cephalosporins differ from each other in their side chains or the r groups okay so there are actually two r groups here in this cephalosporanic acid okay so vancomycin uh, as what i've told you is very crucial particularly for the treatment of of mrsa so take note that vancomycin is not a beta lactam is not a beta lactam antibiotic however like the beta lactams um, vancomycin will also interfere with cell wall synthesis leading to osmotically fragile organisms which means these organisms become much easier to burst um, it is a bactericidal antimicrobial and is effective only against gram-positive organisms. So, so, since it is not a beta-lactam antibiotic, it becomes a treatment of choice for MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So, vancomycin does not bind to the penicillin binding proteins PPP, but rather to the D-alanyl, D-alanyl Termini of the peptidoglycan precursors. So this interference with elongation and cross-linking of the peptido peptidoglycan and this eventually will weaken the cell wall and the organisms will die. Okay, so the second group of antibiotics would involve inhibition of protein synthesis. So we have several um, examples such as the chloramphenicol so by the way protein synthesis binds with a uh, protein synthesis if, if you're able to inhibit protein synthesis you're actually interfering with the function of the uh, ribosomes so ribosomes are important for protein synthesis so incidentally we are eukaryotic and our ribosomes are actually different from the prokaryotic cells so prokaryotic cells ribosomes are would actually have the two subunits of 50s and 30s which is good because it will not interfere with our very own protein synthesis so take a look for example a chloramphenicol binds with 50s portion of ribosomes and inhibits the formation of peptide bonds erythromycin binds with 50s it prevents translocation and movement of ribosomes along the mrna the tetracycline interfere with attachment of tRNA to mRNA ribosome complex, while streptomycin changes the shape of 30S portion, causes the code of mRNA to be read incorrectly. So if we're going to look at the action of these, these antibiotics, all of them boils down to inhibition of protein synthesis. So we have um, several examples of amino glycosides. So this includes your Gentamycin, copramycin, natinmycin, and amicacin. So, microlides um, includes erythromycin, azithromycin, and clarithromycin. So, either they, they act either directly on the ribosome to change its shape and prevent translocation, or on the interaction between mRNA and the ribosomes. So, these agents are. So, take a, let's discuss first the amino glycosides. So these agents are bactericidal and are most effective against gram-negative organisms. However, you do not want to be overdosed with this amino glycoside because it will cause you to be deaf and it will it will destroy your kidneys. So autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity are the side effects. 
So they are bactericidal because um, the binding of the drugs is, rever- is irreversible so that even on dilution, the effect remains on the ribosomes. Okay, so uptake is important since uptake is dependent of oxidative phosphorylation. So the drug is not active in anaerobes or facultative anaerobes such as streptococcus pneumonia. So it's only effective against certain gram-negative organisms. So tetracycline are both spectrum, but they are bacteriostatic. So remember, when you say bacteriostatic, it will not kill bacteria, but it will simply um, retard or stop the growth of the bacteria. So um, they are used uh, for a wide variety of infections, including bacteria such as chlamydia, mycoplasma, Yersinia, and Legionella. Why bacteriostatic? Because the binding of the drug to the ribosome is reverse is reversible. Unlike the other one, aminoglycoside is irreversible, but for tetracycline it is reversible. Meaning, as the drug is diluted, the effect is no longer active. Now chloramphenicol um, is broad spectrum and also bacteriostatic. So it has a good penetration into the CSF but its use has been restricted because of a side effect, meaning it can destroy your bone marrow, which will cause you to have a plastic anemia following or during. So the microlites, um, the first microlite was erythromycin. So yay, Philippine represents because it was discovered in the Philippines. Okay, it has been modified, however, to now a more extended spectrum macrolides, azithromycin and erythromycin. So, these macrolides have longer half-lives, therefore requiring less frequent dosing. So unlike erythromycin, which will require you to have 7 days, so the drug regimen for azithromycin would be much shorter. It has less side effects such as reduced gastrointestinal disturbances. So some drugs or some antibiotics will cause um, destruction of plasma membrane. Meaning, it can co- they can cause injury to plasma membrane. So, these are the polypeptide antibiotics that bring about changes in the permeability of the plasma membrane. So, what will happen? Since the plasma membrane is already matured, um, there would be loss of important metabolites from the microbial cell. So, an example of this would be the polymixin B. Okay. Now, some antibiotics will inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. Meaning to say, um, they can interfere with the process of DNA replication and, trans- and transcription. So, an example of that is rifampin. Is rifampin. So, rifampin inhibits the synthesis of mRNA. So, quinolones will also inhibit DNA synthesis. So, an example of quinolones include um, nalidixic acid, the fluoxacin, and ciprofloxacin. So, let's talk about the fluoroquinolones. So, a number of antimicrobial agents which specifically interfere with the structure and function of DNA have been developed. So, DNA is very important for bacteria, um, of course, because the genetic uh, uh, or the blueprint of the bacteria is actually encoded in the DNA. The genetic blueprint of the bacteria is encoded in DNA. So, so the, the survival of their species and the ability for of them to, of course, to pass codes to their offspring or not, uh, not actually offspring, but to their progeny is actually encoded in the DNA. Okay. However, few have shown selective toxicity for bacterial DNA while not affecting the eukaryotic host DNA. This is quite important because you do not want to become X-Men while drinking antibiotics, right? So, therefore, in the late 1980s, a group of compounds known as the fluoroquinolones came onto the market. So, these agents are analogs of the earlier developed um, nalidixic acid which had been used for several decades in the limited treatment of urinary tract infections. So, the newer quinolones um, proved to be substantially more potent in vitro and broader in antibacterial spectrum than the nalidixic acid. So, these agents interfere 
with the action of the bacterial gyrase. So what is a gyrase? Gyrase is an enzyme, okay? And this enzyme is quite important because it helps to control the supercoiling of the DNA molecule. So it's very important that the DNA molecule, since bacteria do not have nucleus, so the DNA molecule of the bacteria, okay, is simply suspended in its cytoplasm. So gyrase is very important for them because we need them, uh, they need the DNA to be supercoiled in order for the DNA to fit inside the bacterial cell. However, if you interfere with gyrase, what will happen is that the, the DNA supercoiling will eventually uncoil and eventually it will not fit inside the bacterial cell and that will cause a force destruction of the bacterial cell. There. Okay? So the bacterial chromosomes are supercoiled so that it can fit in the bacterial cell. Okay? So in the presence of quinolones, this supercoiling does not occur and the bacterial cell elongates and dies. So Rifantin, which is an anti-TB drug, um, selectively inactivates the cell's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So by inactivating the polymerase, mRNA synthesis is So the organisms um, can be competitive. Um, the, the fifth, I'm sorry for being too fast, but the fifth um, mechanism of, of action is competitive inhibitors of the synthesis of essential metabolites. So organisms can be competitively inhibited by a substance, so we call it the anti metabolite. So there's this one particular substance, we call it the PAPA or the para amino benzoic acid. So this PAPA is important for the synthesis of folic acid and synthesis of folic acid. So the thing is, some drugs such as Sulfatidamide can combine with PAPA, thereby inhibiting the synthesis of folic acid, thereby inhibiting the synthesis of nucleic acid. And without nucleic acid, DNA will not be formed and the force is stop the growth of the bacteria. So, an example of this sulfanidamide is the combination of the trimetophrate and sulfamethoxazole complex. So, what will happen here is that. Um, the paraminobenzoic acid uh, interfere uh, the, the sulfa drugs and trimetophrate interfere with PAPA thereby uh, interfering with the synthesis of dihydrofolic acid and then the sulfa drugs prevent this okay the, 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 the sulfa drugs interfere with the PAPA while the trimetophrate interferes with the conversion of dihydrofolic acid to that of the tetrahydrofolic acid. So without tetrahydrofolic acid, we do not have pyrimidines and purines. These are what? These are important components of the nucleotide bases of that. So, so these agents are the sulfonamides and trimethoprim. So sulfonamides and trimethoprim are synthetic chemotherapeutic agents and are not produced naturally by other microorganisms. So these agents have a chemical core that resembles the para amino benzoic acid or PAPA. So take a look, sulfamidamide has all of the same chemical structure with that of the para amino benzoic acid. So sulfa drug competes for the enzyme that converts PAPA during the synthesis of folic acid. So if the micro cannot synthesize folic acid, it cannot make the precursor for the nucleic acid synthesis, which is the dihydrofolic acid. Okay? So why do sulfa drugs do not compete for the synthesis of folic acid in humans? As you can see here, sulfa drugs okay, are can only perform only in microbes. So this step in folic acid synthesis is performed only by microbes. We cannot synthesize folic acid. So because folic acid is required in our diet. Imagine microorganisms can synthesize their own folic acid. Okay? So this synthetic agent also acts on the enzyme systems involved in nucleic acid synthesis. So as you can see, the trimetoprim, as what I told you a while ago, um, prevent 
a ketoconversion of dihydrofolic acid to tetrahydrofolic acid by inhibiting the dihydrofolic reductase. Without tetrahydrofolic acid, you don't have pyrimidines, you don't have purines, and without pyrimidines and purines, you do not have uh, guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytosine. These are the token titrations of the DNA. So, why does it trimetrophic interfere with mammalian dihydrofolic reductase and impair our nucleic acid synthesis? Primarily because our DHFA enzyme does not recognize trimetrophic as a potential substrate and therefore it doesn't interfere with the tetrahydrofolic acid there. So, that, so this is just a summary of what I have actually discussed. Now, let's talk about um, chemotera, uh, test guide to chemotera. Um, as a medical technologist, um, it is our role in the laboratory to determine um, which antibiotics uh, would be most suitable for a patient. So, the solution by one of the most common requests being done in the laboratory is the culture and sensitivity test. So, patient, uh, I mean, the physician sends sample, sends sample to the lab, in the lab, and then we isolate the bacteria, we identify the bacteria. After identifying the bacteria, we perform susceptibility testing so that we'll be able to know which among the antibiotics would be most effective in killing this microorganism. So that's the reason why we have several methods, such as the diffusion methods, the protection test, and nowadays we have also the autopsy test. So um, we have the Kirby Bauer diffusion, Kirby Bauer diffusion technique. Um, in Kirby Bauer, this is also known as this diffusion technique, wherein we, this is the Muller Hinton agar, and we place antibiotic test, and then we measure the zone of diffusion and interpret it as susceptible or resistant, and some, some, somewhere in between, uh, we, have a, we have a term called as intermediate. Okay? So actually, each year, um, the diameter to be considered as susceptible, we call it breakpoints. And CLS, the Clinical Laboratory Science Institute, each year, okay, um, will actually um, revise the breakpoint in order for the bacteria to be considered or as susceptible to that antibiotic or resistant to that antibiotic. So, unfortunately, the break point to be considered as susceptible is actually um, increasing. Meaning, many bacteria have actually become resistant to antibiotics. Okay. So, the term susceptible is used to refer to organisms susceptible to the concentration of antibiotics that are achievable in the blood patients with normal dose schedule. Okay? We do not want to encounter resistant bacteria because the term resistant is used to refer to organisms that have an MIC higher than the level of drug that is achievable in the blood of patients with a normal dose Okay, which I will explain to you later. So, some, somewhere in between, we call it intermediate. So, when we say um, intermediate, uh, the term intermediate refers to organisms that have MIC to a drug that is borderline between the sensitive and resistant. Okay? When would this be a useful drug? Uh, if you do not have a sensitive drug, susceptible drug, well, maybe um, intermediate drug uh, would be useful. So a drug that has an intermediate susceptibility to an organism may be useful if high drug levels can be delivered to a body site either by simply increasing the dose, so increase the dosage, or if the drug is concentrated in a particular organ. So, if the drug is concentrated in the kidneys and excreted in the urine, the drug may be useful in the treatment of urinary drug infections. Okay, so it's not totally useless. So, the Kirby Power, okay, was introduced by doctors Kirby and Power in the 1960s and is referred to the Kirby Power testing. So, paper discs are impregnated with a given concentration of antibiotic and placed on the load of bacteria. So here, um, uh, the, the culture medium that we're using here is an example of 
cooler heat for agar. So what will happen is that the drug will push us out of the disc or from the disc. So if the drug inhibits the growth of the organ insects, you'll be able to see the zone of inhibition. So there are several factors that may affect the Kirby Bauer technique. So number one is the diffusibility of the antibiotics. So the antibiotics must be able to diffuse from the paper disc. And then of course, uh, we have also the thickness of the agar. So we are only using 20 ml agar. Amount of inoculum can be controlled by comparing the turbidity of your inoculum with a 0.5 McFarland standard. So 0.5 McFarland standard, okay? So McFarland standard is made up of sulfuric acid barium chloride. So if we're going to combine sulfuric acid and barium chloride, so the 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 product is a barium sulfate and it will cause turbidity or precipitate. So a 0.5 McFarland standard, okay, is equivalent to 1.5 times 10 to the 8 cells per ml. Okay, so I, I want you to write it down. 1.5 times 10 to the 8. So 10 and then superscript 8 cells per ml. So that is the standard amount of inoculum that you're supposed to use in Kirby Bauer technique. Okay, the growth rate of microorganisms is also a factor. Um, actually, if you're using mycobacterium tuberculosis, it will take you more and it will take you at least a month before you can get the result. Unlike if you're using ordinary bacteria such as E. coli, after 18 hours you have the result of it. And then the suitability of the medium use, uh, we are using liver heat on agar, but for fastidious organisms, we are using blood agar paint. Um, the discrepancy in inoculation and incubation, and of course, the pH of the Okay, so the width of the zone of inhibition is measured using a micro caliper. If you don't have micro caliper, at least meron kayong ruler, okay? And compared to standards to determine whether the organism is sensitive or resistant to the drug. We call it breakpoints, okay? So for example, uh, with ampicillin, a zone size of less than 13 mm indicates resistance, while if it's more than 17 mm, it indicates susceptible strain. So between 13 to 17, we call it intermediate. Okay? So to be considered, so the break point of being susceptible is more than 17. The break point of being resistant is less than 13 zone of evil. So, we can also um, determine the MIC. So, later on, I will be discussing to you what an MIC is. Minimum inhibitory concentration. Okay? So, there's another um, variation of paper this, but this time, it's, we call it the E-test. Um, the gradient diffusion susceptibility testing. It uses a strip instead of a disc because each layer here represents an MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration. Last time consuming that brought the illusion because the standard, the gold standard for determining MIC or minimum inhibitory concentration is by means of broad the illusion. Okay, however, um, uh, we also, nowadays you also have the automated methods which I uh, by the way, I will also be including modules in this module, um, YouTube animation for some of the useful um, broad diffusion methods. So remember that it, that um, e test is more expensive than the Kirby Power method. So let's talk about the broad diffusion method. Okay, um, broad diffusion method is very important, especially if you want to know the MIC. MIC. Minimum inhibitory concentration refers to the lowest concentration of the microorganisms that can inhibit the growth of the microorganisms. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, let me rephrase that. Okay, MIC refers to the lowest concentration of antibiotics or of the antimicrobial agent that will that can inhibit the growth of bacteria. Okay, 
So, which means that you will be diluting, diluting um, the antibiotics, okay? And then, from the diluted antibiotics, you will add microorganisms or you'll add bacteria. And then, you intubate it overnight. And the next morning, you look for the presence of turbidity. Okay, so it means that the more turbid the organisms, I mean, I mean the turbidity is equivalent to growth. If the solution becomes clear, it means that there is no growth. So as you can see, zero concentration up to 2 microgram per ml, let's say blue here represents growth, it means that organisms grow. So from this particular series of two, we can determine the MIC, and the MIC is 4 micrograms per ml. Okay, because it is, it is the tube that has the lowest concentration of drug that remains clear, meaning there's no growth. Okay, uh, it determines the MIC for that particular drug. So this result is compared to standard to determine whether this concentration indicates that the organism is susceptible or, okay, so for example, an MIC of more of less than 8 would be called sensitive for gram negative bacilli against a well, 32 microgram would be considered resistant for that particular bug drug combination. So, since it is 4, then it may be considered as sensitive because the breakpoint is 8 microgram per ml. Okay, so the minimum inhibitory concentration. Uh, I have already defined this to you a while ago. So, the lowest concentration of the antimicrobial that is capable of preventing the growth. Okay, we call it MIC. And after determining the MIC, we can determine the MIC or the minimum bactericidal concentration. Okay, the lowest concentration of the bacteria that can kill 99.9% .9 of the Mali, mali. Let me rephrase that. The lowest concentration of the of the antibiotics that can kill 99.9% .9 of the bacteria. Okay? So that is the M. Okay? So, for example, um, you have your MIC tubes. So, all you have to do is to inoculate all the clear tubes in a separate petri dishes and check for the growth. Okay? So, as you can see here, only the 128 microgram per ml doesn't have any microbial growth at all. So, therefore, the 128 micro, uh, microgram per ml is considered to be as the MX. And if you notice now, we're using a lot of amount of antibiotics here. However, nowadays, we have the microbial dilution. Okay, so there are a number of commercial companies that use small volumes of broth. So that's the reason why we call it the micro broth dilution. And it's standardized antimicrobial concentration. So due to the amount of labor required to set up the traditional tubes, imagine these big gas tubes, commercial companies have developed micro broth, micro broth NYC systems. So both automated and semi-automated instruments are available to read every code code pattern. So, um, alongside with this module, I will be um, uh, including um, what are the innovation nowadays that the, the commercial companies are actually using for antimicrobial system. And MBC, we have already defined an MBC. So, it says here, uh, MBC refers to Bactericidal antimicrobials have an MBC of no more than two to four times than MIC, while bacteriostatic antibiotics have MB MBCs much higher than the MIC. Okay, so that's how we determine whether the antimicrobials are bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Why? Because with bactericidal drugs, the effect is irreversible, and diluting out the antibiotic does not reduce the drug effect. Remember what we've discussed on aminoglycosides? Okay, so 
We also have the automated susceptibility testing. So the MIC method of antimicrobial susceptibility performing testing is far too cumbersome, particularly for large-scale testing. That's the reason why that is never being done in the laboratory. Perhaps maybe during emergency kitchens when the instruments back down. So the method can be performed in a micro method where the process has been adapted to micro tighter things or small plastic cards which contains antibiotics in the appropriate conditions. So bacteria are added and then the cards or trays can be read by an instrument. So this method of susceptibility testing is widely used in the diagnostic microbiology laboratories. So there you have it. This has been another lecture in antimicrobial susceptibility or antimicrobial drugs. So this has been Dr. Sukhachay Basit saying, wherever you are, stay safe and God bless everyone.